wanted to give you guys a little background on Father Turbo. Um, I know I've talked about him a, a good bit. Um, so his, uh, one of his primary roles is as a case manager um, and a counselor for uh, reconciliation services in Kansas City. Um, it's a long-standing uh, social outreach, but it's uh, they also it's connected with their church, um, St. Mary of Egypt in Kansas City. Um, uh, mainly, the the person who started reconciliation services is uh, Father Alexi uh, Alta School. If, if you can say it again, um, uh, <coughs> uh, yeah. Uh, it, many years ago, um, as an outreach, uh, Kansas City has. I'll tell you, most, most of you guys know I work over at Fort Jackson, and I had a trainee the other day, and I said something about Kansas City, because she was from there, and I told her the, the road that they're on, it's Truce Avenue, and when I told her that, she looked at me really funny, she said, there's a priest on that road? And, she, and I said, yeah, and she said, which part of that road? Because there's a part that's really great, and there's an awful part, but they live more toward, or they, they work more towards the, the awful part. Um, and it's been that way for quite a while. A lot of um, all of the, the urban issues, um, the, everything under the sun. Um, but they've been doing great work there. Um, if you get a chance to look up reconciliation services, they have amazing things um, that are going on there. So he works as a, a, a case manager there. Um, he's also the assistant priest at, at St. Mary's. Um, he's a professional artist, uh, well studied in contemporary and classical methods of art. Um, he studied in, in the, uh, make sure I'm getting all these right, Prosopone School of Iconography? Prosopone, yeah. There you go, yeah. Prosopone. Um, yeah, that's Italian, what am I doing? Um, studied under uh, contemporary master uh, Stamidis? Stamatis. 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 <laughs> there you go, that, again, of Athens, um, and completed the St. Stephen's House of Studies course in theology with a focus in iconology. Um, He's a former president of the South, uh, the South California or Southern California um, Brotherhood chapter, which is a it was, it's very vibrant, um, and uh, has been the dean of chapters for a long time. Yeah, for quite a while. Um, it, so he has a lot. I have a lot of interaction with him um, because of our chapter and what we're doing here. Um, but he also gets to see what's going on all over uh, with the Brotherhood. Um, so, the reason that he is here is because, uh, well, Father Thomas was really interested in the Brotherhood coming and doing the conference. Um, and as we were getting closer to that, we realized that not everybody knows what the Brotherhood is. There's not a ton of media out there. Um, they haven't been around these parts in, in quite a while, or if ever. Um, and there's a lot out there in the media of all kinds of different groups that are coming up, um, that have come up recently or just a long time ago that might get confused um, with them. Um, so, we thought Father uh, Turbo would be a great person to have um, to kind of explain some of those things. And as I got more and more questions from you guys about different issues um, as to what are, what's our outlook, what are we trying to do with this, what's it gonna look like, um, I figured probably the best way to do that was to talk to Father Turbo about what's been done and and how do we approach our particular community. Um, so with that, hand it over to Father Turbo. Um, and I'll, I actually will start by asking Father Turbo a couple questions. Um, we'll get his response and then we'll open it up to you guys. If, does that sound good, Father? Sure. <laughs> um, so one of the things, so we started off with sort of just a study group um, with the Brotherhood. We studied uh, Father Alexi's book, uh, Wade in the River, um, which has a lot of great history, most of it on the, the saints and the lives of the saints. Um, but as we went through that, um, a lot of it, that particular book looks at um, American history, um, a lot of it focusing on the history of Christianity in Africa and through the Levant, um, and then how it, how it relates to the African American experience here. Um, it really covers quite a lot of, of time, um, but what it comes back to, it, it, it does this all under an orthodox understanding. Um, as we got through that book, and, and I had a lot of questions of, you know, this is awesome, I never knew half of these things. 
we really need to share this, um, which is always a good response and is a very orthodox response. Um, the question of how do we share this, how do we go about that, we don't proselytize. That's not really, it's, it's actually kind of forbidden, right? Um, and we're not trying to sell seats, right? So as Orthodox, we, we really, if it comes down to two monks on Athos, the church hasn't changed at all, right? Um, we, we still have the same connection to the Lord, and that's who does everything. So, um, so that's not our, our concern. What it is our concern is our witness to the, to the external community. Um, if, if the people around us did not know about us, they don't know what we believe, um, they haven't seen Christ in us, um, it, or, well, if they don't know us, they can't see Christ in us, right? So the question of how do we engage people, how do we show them so th this pearl of great price um, came up a lot. And being that Father Turbo has done that um, in several different places and, and helped in several different situations, um, we kind of wanted to uh, ask, with our community, where do we start with engaging the larger community, those people who, because of their background or their um, experience, would never come into in contact with us. People from backgrounds that, or, or belief systems we wouldn't even agree with. Sure. Um, how do we engage them? Uh, well, before I actually get into that, I'd like to kind of throw some things out. You go for it. You know, go for it. Uh, I don't know if it was, forgive me, I was talking in the back and then I was getting coffee and I was kind of preoccupied with that. But. Uh, a couple things. Number one, uh, the format of everything is please be open, ask questions. Um, I could very easily come and lecture to you about something, but because this is an in-house family conversation, there's no need to lecture. We need to dialogue. So don't be bashful, okay? That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, you know, I'm gonna start off with this understanding is that we're Catholic. We're Catholic, we are the Catholic Church. Um, and so the imperative in regards of manifesting that church is one that our Lord gave. It's not one that should be um, mistaken for any type of um, sentimental need. It shouldn't be um, manifested because of guilt or anything like that. It's simply because our Lord Jesus uh, asked us to go out and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that understanding is key. Now the reason why I want to lay out that foundation is because as I go forward and start laying some things out, it's imperative that you understand I'm not giving you a platitude. One of the things that's very problematic is that people oftentimes with good intentions, they give platitudes. Platitudes are given because someone may not have a full understanding of an issue and they don't want to leave someone hanging. So if you feel like I haven't answered the question adequately, push back a little bit because it's in that dialogue of pushing and pulling that will actually be mining and going deep and the spirit will reveal things, right? So that being said, you start off with prayer. You have to understand our theology and that our theology is, should never be approached from a forensic or academic sense per se, but rather as uh, Archimandrite Sophroni says, it's experiential, right? Our orthodox theology is lived which means you can't just approach it abstractly as a book. St. Theophan Reclusi talks about people reading about prayer, right? but you need to pray, actually. So I would say the first thing is you actually need to pray. And prayer not just being in the liturgical sense, you need to be people of prayer, which means that everything will be flowing out from the altar. So as you prepare yourselves to receive the chalice, you come and you're enlightened and you're illumined, you go back out and then you encounter people at Circle K. I don't know if you have Circle K, so whatever we you do, have. We do. Right. We so do. you encounter people at Circle K, at the Piggly Wiggly, at wherever, <laughs> right? But as you're living an Orthodox life, fasting, confessing, praying, doing works of mercy, all these things, you become the broken bread and the poured out wine for your community, okay? Now, Prayer is primary. St. Moses, the black, he says that if a man's prayer is not in line with his actions, right, he labors in vain, right? Right contemplation brings right action. So prayer that doesn't produce fruit, you have to question it. You have to question it. Now that being said, the question becomes, 
well, why do we need to reach out to certain people groups in particular? Well, the thing is you don't. You don't have to do anything. But you should, because we're Catholic. Because the expression of the church needs to be reflected inside this body. Wherever the bishop comes and serves, the fullness of the church is present. So holy apostles manifest the fullness of the church when the Eucharist is celebrated. Simply put, you should want that to reflect the larger community. So that's where I would start. I would start with prayer, with an understanding of a, of a Catholic heart, meaning universal, meaning that the people that you are surrounded should reflect that. Now that being said, when you go out and you naturally encounter people as God has, uh, you know, for those little provi uh, providential encounters, guess what happens, actually? You meet people, um, and then you become a little bit more familiar. As you become familiar, then relationships begin to bud organically. And as they bud, right, the Holy Spirit opens up opportunities by which you encounter each other more deeply. And as you do that, right, St. Sefer of Sarav, what does he say? Acquire the spirit of peace, right, and a thousand around you will be saved. As you do that, as God wills, opportunities will begin to open. As those opportunities open, you begin to understand people's needs. Those needs aren't always material. Oftentimes those needs are emotional or spiritual. You know, it's not just the priest who brings Christ to people, right? As Peter talks about the real priesthood, each one of you, as you're participating in the life of the Eucharist, you're to bring Christ to people. And that's going to look different for each person. So I want to be very careful not to lay out a program as such because the problem with programs is that um, they limit people's vision. These are the parameters by which we're supposed to operate in this program. That's problematic. Um, and people aren't programs, right? People aren't programs. What we're talking about are living, breathing human souls, okay? And those living, breathing human souls are yearning for Christ. You just have to look outside your door or turn on the TV and you can see the world around you is yearning for Christ. If that's not enough to get you out there, I don't know what to say. But that's a starting point. And then really, that's where a community can come together and begin a, kind of like, almost like assessing the needs, right? Are there shut-ins, right? Are there people who have material needs? Are there people who are maybe, uh, they have an uh, aspect of the faith, but they're looking for something deeper. They're looking for the, the fullness of the faith, right? It could be a Bible study. It could be all kinds of things. I just don't want to be too forthright yet and say, oh, do this and this and that, right? But I, having a foundation is where you would start. So, so one of the, to, to piggyback on that, one of the things that uh, Father Thomas, in his vision, one of the things that, as he and I have talked, um, one of his, because of all the work he's done here, most of our parish, right, most of us are, are from a Protestant background, most of us are of European descent, um, and we kind of we kind of look like each other. We have different, similar passages into Orthodoxy, and we're largely a convert parish, right? They start somewhere. Even if we go back to the, I don't know, even the 70s, if, if the Greeks were to see somebody from a Protestant background come into their church, they kind of wonder what was going on. If you read um, Father Gilquist's uh, Becoming Orthodox, he talks about how foreign it was, that it, they just didn't know, they were wondering, what are you up to, you know? Um, we're past that, and Orthodoxy really has opened up in this country, and, and people are seeing it. Now as we do that, we have to turn around and, and look to those people that may not have those connections that we have, that may not have had that exposure like we have. So um, as we do that, um, a lot of times we have this, these competing concepts um, that happen, we, we had it in the, in the discussion group. Are we, are we setting out a sign on, on, our, on our highway here and are we saying, uh, free soup to anybody that wants to become Orthodox? Um, are we saying, uh, you know, we'll give you t-shirts, come to church for us? I mean, we see that stuff all over the place, and we clearly know that's, that's not where we're at. Um, but there is this difficulty in deciphering, is it a social 
approach that we're taking, or are we just, how do we not fall into that, I guess, is probably what I'm trying to say. Sure, I, I think one of the things to understand, again, getting back to, so I like movies that give you the kind of ending of the movie, and then goes back the rest of the film to kind of tell you how you got there. So let me tell you the end of this film. The end of this film is, the more that we actually understand our orthodox faith, questions will be answered. So all I'm really going to do, God willing, is point you to what orthodoxy, what our tradition says. The key is to not look at my finger, but to look at what I'm pointing at, okay? So, as C.S. Lewis says, you don't have a body and, and a spirit or a soul. That's what you are. That's what you are. Understanding what the church tells us human beings are is key, right? When you see the, this dichotomy of social outreach and just you, the church doesn't want to devolve into a, a social justice program, the problem with, with that line of thinking is that, and the problem where that does happen, because it does happen, is that people have disincarnated the human being, right? So in other words, this idea of, well, let's just save the soul, right? That's all that kind of like really matters. That's not orthodox, actually. That's Gnostic, if anything. People's material needs is, are very important. But the thing is, is having a discerning, humble approach to that individual. You would be surprised that you may see someone that you interpret their dress or something and think they have material needs, but they may not actually. They may just have a different taste in clothing. You may not know. What they actually may need is a measure of friendship or conversation, right? You may see someone who's well put together and they may have material needs. What's my point? My point is you have to actually address the person and really begin to understand where that person is at. And just to be frank, to kind of start cracking the ice, when you're talking about um, communities that aren't necessarily traditionally associated with orthodoxy, like African-American communities, be very careful to not have an approach that says it's a monolithic experience. The reality of it is, is that, just to be very frank with you, many people who would even find themselves in the, in the doors of an orthodox church already have a certain context by which they're able to kind of perceive certain things about orthodoxy. They may be able to see there's a richness in, in the prayer or the worship. They may be able to understand there's some sort of depth in the spirituality. Don't allow some of your own misgivings or misperceptions of that individual to keep them from that, right? Don't assume just by your reading the externals that someone may not actually understand what you're talking about when you get into the theology of the fathers. Don't, don't assume that. And don't also assume that the foreignness that many of us have had to overcome, that they're not willing to overcome it either, because I was, right? It's important that we actually begin to take that old adage of don't judge a book by its cover and really kind of crack the book a little bit. And I will tell you, it's easy to say that, but it's very difficult, isn't it, if we're being honest? It's very difficult to um, not even approach, but engage with someone who is different. It's difficult, but I would say again, getting back to building off of the Catholic understanding, we're Christians and we're, and we're Catholic. So that universal expression of the church, you know, the Lord said in that day when you're brought before the judges and the synagogues, right? The Holy Spirit will give you what you need to say. We're not talking about judges and synagogues and, and terrible things like that, but we are talking about something that can feel like that. You can feel like you're on trial when you're in a space with someone that you're not familiar with. But the Holy Spirit will give you that courage and that wisdom when you need it. And I think that's important because that's the fruit of that prayer. The fruit of your prayer will be the ability to navigate in the world, right? Our prayer connects us and unites us with God, but it also allows us to be messengers, if you will, right? And those who he sends, he equips. That's very important to understand, to understand that. Um, so I've got 
so we're Orthodox, um, true faith, true worship. Um, we've kind of covered that, you know, praying, coming to church, that, that these are these are good, um, and that and that they're. Enough, and listening, I would say listening is a shorthand for that. Sure. Actually, learning to listen, right? Which is what prayer so should teach us to actually learn right. to listen to God. So you need to listen to the people who God is bringing into your circumstance, right. and that's how you'll know what needs to. Meet. So, um, Father Thomas, over his uh, over his office, he's actually got a plaque that says, uh, "Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable." Right. <laughs> Very good. And it and it's and it's good and it's 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 a good personal reminder, right? Um, why? Why do we? Is it is it essential to our experience as Orthodox to become uncomfortable? Is does that have anything to do with the faith? And yeah, sure. That's part of it. So uh, Saint John Maximovich, yes, everyone's familiar with the great Saint John. Okay. I have a deep, deep love and veneration for Saint John. Uh, he's answered many prayers in my life, in my family's life, um, and Saint John. He, at one point, um, and if I'm not mistaken, it was in a conversation he had with Father Sarah from Rose, but at any rate, St. John Maximovich, he, he begins to kind of break down some of the reasons why um, the Russian people were afflicted in the, in the revolution. I mean, you probably already know this, right? But it was in that affliction, number one, because of the sins of the Russian people, right? St. John Kronstadt speaks about this as well as St. Ignatius Brinacino. But another thing was that that facilitated the Russian folk being sent out. And as they were immigrants, right, and as they were refugees fleeing Russia, the pearl of orthodoxy was spread with them. So it was, them, it was by them being made uncomfortable that orthodoxy was brought to other lands. And if they were not made uncomfortable, many of us here would not be orthodox, because many of us have come in through Father Seraphim and St. Hermans, which were the spiritual children of St. Saint, of Saint John. I could go on and on and on. Uh, I can, let's just go back, though, and let's look at the apostles. Right? If the apostles were comfortable, none of us would be Christian. We'd all still be Gentiles. It was explicitly in their being made uncomfortable that they were dispersed and, set and spread throughout the land. So, clearly, being made uncomfortable is something that God does. I mean, I, how do you make a pearl? Is it a pearl of grain of sand? Is yeah. to the irritation of the pearl of, of that grain of sand in the in the uh, clam, right? In the oyster. How do you make a diamond? It's through incredible pressure. These are symbols, natural symbols in the world that speak to us of spiritual realities. So one of the biggest things about orthodoxy, and I was just sharing this with my spiritual brother Cordis over there, you know. Father Sarah from Rose, he basically says, I'm summarizing it, that our faith is a suffering faith. And that if it wasn't, there'd be no need for talking of heaven in the afterlife. This, your job here is not to be comfortable. You know what the root word of parish is? You know where that comes from? It comes from exile. A parish is a place of exile. This is not your home. And a big part of the failings that many of us encounter with church with Christianity is we lose sight of that and then we want to build little utopias where we're at where we will never be disturbed you can have that but guess what you'll also have is a stagnant life spiritually you will never grow and you'll never actually see the fullness of Christ if you're comfortable like that you don't encounter the resurrected Christ without encountering the crucified Christ so that's why it's imperative to understand the need to be made uncomfortable. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing that comes to mind when you say that is the city of Laodicea in Revelations. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I feel like this may make some people uncomfortable. Good. But, um, so I am a descendant of slave owners. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and because of that, I have chosen in my life that I need to purposefully take steps to be better than those that came before me in that aspect. And what I have found, first of all, like, have you been to the South before? Like, I mean, the Bible Belt and... 
For me, myself, personally? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. you know, I work at a place well where, yeah. I work at a place where people use the N-word, yeah. you know, behind closed doors. Sure. I work with people. I work at a place where they use it in op open doors. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, it's it's in our face all this time. Sure. This okay racial, sure. you know, tension. And... Have, being one of those converts to orthodoxy, and, I, and hopefully it all ties together in your mind the same way. I'm tracking with you. That's good. But being one of those converts to orthodoxy, you know, I went to a Bible college. I studied with some people that know the Bible far more better than me. They know the history far more better than me. They knew what orthodoxy was before I knew what orthodoxy was. And we're in this Bible belt where faith in general is their tradition of faith. It's my grandfather's, grandfather's, grandfather's faith, and that's why I'm Baptist or Lutheran or, or whatever. So we're coming from this, this background where we're confronted with people that, in my experience in the Orthodox Church, probably know the scriptures better than we know the scriptures, mm -hmm. because that's all they lean on mm -hmm. in that, you know. And, you know, we... we Orthodox has orthodoxy has a tendency to be perceived by the communities that we're in as being very arrogant. Mm -hmm. And when we make fun of phrases like sola scriptura, you know, what what sometimes we miss is we're not not that scripture scripture alone, but that scripture alone has authority. So they throw out that tradition of the orthodoxy. And this is this is the generation that has been Christian so long that many of them are post-Christian. Mm -hmm. Like, we're becoming a post-Christian society with the label of Christianity. And in that community, there are African-American communities that have clung so dearly to their Christianity that to ask them to even consider orthodoxy or to consider another way of doing something in my experience, is borderline offensive mm -hmm. to them to question what they believe when they believe it's all. I mean, the struggles that the African American community has had to come through, and it's and it's where all it had was its faith to get it through it. Mm -hmm. I'm not African American. I'm not going to try to speak for African sure, Americans, sure. but I don't feel like I'm very far off. And who am I as an Orthodox Christian? to approach anyone, I don't have a problem at all approaching non-Christians. You know, most of the non-Christians, most of the atheists that I think that we encounter on a daily basis are people that have tried Christianity, but it didn't work right. out. They have the you inoculation. Know? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Europe, most of Europe is very much becoming like that. Sure. Um, so how can we, as a congregation, get past our own personal culture of orthodoxy, invade, in a way, the, the faith culture of the communities around us in a way that's seen as friendship, or I want them to see orthodoxy the way I see orthodoxy, mm -hmm. without them having to feel like they have to give up what has become so synonymous with being African American mm -hmm. or being German American or whatever you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I mean, we know. I think I know 99% of the people here. But like, I wouldn't think that there's anybody in this room that wouldn't say, you know, I love this community. I want to reach out to this community, and we talk about it a lot. But for the most part, we don't do it. Mm -hmm. So, what lights the fire? under us to broach the uncomfortableness of leaving our bubble, mm -hmm. invading somebody else's comfort bubble, mm -hmm. and somewhere in there making that connection and inviting them into orthodoxy to the point of, if they never become orthodox, will I still be their friend? Great. Perfect. Okay. Water, please. Can I get a water? What's that? Water. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Love the question. It's perfect. Go on. Perfect perfect, 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 perfect. I feel like someone gave me an underhand pick. It's great. Um, the first thing is, 
This is not a platitude. Okay. Prayer. You said, thank you, what lights the fire? It actually is prayer. But you have to now enter into a different space of prayer. St. Thea Family Recluse, when you, when you read his work, especially on prayer, which is contained in a couple of different volumes, uh, depending on the translation, right? You know, he highlights something very interesting. <clears throat> and St. Theophan is a profound example for us now because he, he, he's like this liminal father of the church. He has his hand in, in this, in the older patristic mindset coming into the modern era, right? And he understands this reality that people, their concept of prayer is they have their prayer book and they go at a certain time in the icon corner and they read their prayer book. St. Theophan is very clear, he says, this is not prayer. And other fathers will talk about it, but St. Theophan is probably more accessible to everyone here. He says, this is not prayer. It's a form of prayer. It's good, but it's not prayer. He says, when you're praying, you're doing your prayer rule, and something comes to mind, you're supposed to stop, actually. And you're supposed to pray for that person from your heart, and then pick up your prayer rule. Why am I saying this? Because I can't reinforce it enough. You can't do anything on your own. This, I'm not just like saying that because I'm supposed to. You can't do anything without the help of God and the Holy Spirit. You can't hear from the Holy Spirit unless you're consciously preparing yourself daily. Not just when it's time for liturgy, not just out of your obligation. You have to become a person of prayer and understand what that means. When you do that, God will open up opportunities. Many, 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 many moons ago, I was at a monastery speaking to the larger body of Southern California Orthodox Christians at a gathering that, was, that happened once a month. And I was speaking about my first time at, at, at uh, the St. Moses Conference. And someone asked me, uh, a priest asked me, he said, oh, uh, how do I get more African Americans in my church? And I said, Father, you can't. There's nothing you can do. That's a very dissatisfying answer. But the reason why I said that to him was, the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit was to pour out some sort of revival on African Americans, which I pray to God that he's beginning to, and I think things like this is the fruit of it, because usually these types of interactions, uh, these types of events have happened on the coast or in places where there's already kind of an awareness. The fact that I'm here shows me that something's happening. <laughs> that's, that's the first thing, right? But let's just say God pours out uh, this, this grace on the community here, and African Americans are now interested, and other people are interested, right? Is Holy Apostles ready to receive them? Right. Are you? Because let me tell you something, just like I told Father, which, again, I know these aren't pleasant or satisfactory answers, but they're true ones. And if you face truth, right, then you're set free. It is better that people don't come than for them to come and not receive a warm welcome of hospitality. I'm telling you. Because if people were to start to come in mass, right? I'm not talking about one African American here or there. Right. What happens if two families come in? Three families come in. How comfortable will you be? Right? We love it. Thank God. <laughs> so what needs to happen then is in that the other communities during a pan-Orthodox Vespers. They're introduced to the Greek church over there and over there, you see? And then those families now begin to interact and say, man, this is wonderful. Because here's the thing. My mother, memory eternal, was, oh, she was a staunch Baptist. She loved it, right? I will tell you, right? And I tell you this with all humility. That is not the fullness of the faith. It's simple. It's simple. Their love of scripture is actually a love of an interpretation of scripture. See, we have to really understand that in a deeper sense, not in a sense of like we're gonna one-up them, like, like you know how certain sects will come and try to have these sword battles of scripture, but rather understanding in our church, we have the center of the universe, which is the Eucharist. Do we really, really, really believe that? Because if we really, really, really believe that, our life will be changed not just internally, but the way we interact with people. Okay. So that's the first thing, because you asked how we get the fire. The fire comes from understanding those things deeply in the way that I'm talking about. And I know Father, 
would love to walk your community through it. And instead of reading about incredible experiences of the Eucharist during liturgy, you will have incredible experiences of the Eucharist during liturgy. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, when you understand that African Americans, in particular, because of the incredible pressures that have been put on the community in this country, have this incredible allegiance to Jesus. Incredible allegiance to Jesus. That being said, one of the most, um, this is, there was a Pew poll, forgive me, it might be kind of old now, it might have been from like 2012, which is kind of old, so it's only gotten worse, right? African Americans were one of the top ranked religious uh, people groups in America, okay? Meaning, when they did the survey, African Americans said, yes, I'm a Christian, yes, I go to church, yes, I read the Bible, blah, 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 right? How is it then that currently, right now, amongst especially millennials, but in general, one of the most unchurched, unchurch attending demographics are African American males? How is that? I can tell you why that is. Because the African American church, the black church in America, guess what? It's going the wayside just like every other church in America. It may have its own ways in which it's maybe compromised the integrity of what it had, but it's compromised. And people are searching. We were just talking about that this morning. A vast majority of young African Americans find themselves in these different sects. They call it consciousness, you know, the conscious community. Everything from, you know, Hebrew Israelites to all these other sects that are pulling on a power that is, and I'm going to use my words very carefully here, but I'm going to use it intentionally, and I'll stand by it. They're pulling on a power that's demonic. Here's how I'm defining that. What does James say? Wisdom. Central wisdom is demonic, is it not? This is what James says, right? So many uh, young African Americans are being pulled into sex, um, Islam, and other things because it's appealing to their lower senses of justice and anger and all these other things, which they're there, but they're not being addressed and healed with the science of the heart that the church holds. You see what I'm saying? So the Baptist church has not been able to address those things fully, because if it was, you wouldn't have so many African Americans leaving, which is happening, actually. Now, here's the thing. When we understand that we are just beggars bringing bread to others, that makes all the difference. It's not enough to say, I want to be humble. You actually have to be humble because people will smell paternalism a mile away, right? But my brother, to be really honest with you, uh, everything you just said here and just looking at you right now, I think people would receive you because I can sense from your heart sincerity and a humility. Being able to come boldly like you did here and speak about, honestly, that reality, you guys have been doing that already. You need to continue to do it. You need to continue to do it in an orthodox manner with wisdom and humility. When you do that, I'm sure in everyone's family here isn't vastly orthodox. I'm sure you have cousins and uncles and aunts who aren't orthodox who are participating in the kind of casual racism that we're talking about, right? Well, it's a different thing if we're around the water cooler or around the pumpkin pie, whatever we're around, you know, peach pie, peach cobbler, here, probably. And we're talking about the various issues. It's very different if you come at it from an orthodox perspective. I will tell you this from experience. I'm sure all of you have experienced it before. You've had those moments where maybe something flies out of your mouth and you're like, oh, wow. You know, it's almost like I am actually listening in the liturgy, you know? And people are surprised by maybe that level of love or humility or wisdom that's patristic and it comes out. It's sometimes just the smallest word. I guess if I was to like condense what I'm saying to you, I would encourage you not to despise the small things, truly. Don't despise, number one, not putting someone in their place per se, but if you don't participate in the casual racism around the water cooler, over time people will notice. If you actually speak to that person in your workplace who other people avoid because of the casual racism, guess what? 
they'll notice. It'll soften their hearts. See, the problem is, is we want to have results and numbers and all that. Forget that. One soul is, when one soul repents, all of the angels rejoice. Right? If you actually say that, not just because that sounds good, but if you actually believe, right? I just told Cordis. Cordis has been faithful in his work for decades. The reason why I'm here today, the reason why I'm a priest, the reason why I'm in the Orthodox Church is directly linked to Cordis's work, which no one knew. He sold a book to someone, which I got, and here you are. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But the point <laughs> being is I'm here because of Cordis' simple, faithful work. Let me give a warning to everyone here and anyone who would see this. The Orthodox Church must be aware to not buy into the spirituality of American materialism. This is not political, this is spiritual. We are not to emulate the programs of the mega churches. That is not who we are, that is not our spirituality. We do the services, we fast, we pray, we serve as God gives us, he gives us grace, and then the rest comes. When we begin to try to have programs, we go the way of the people in the temple buying and selling. Do not do that. Do not do that. It's not about trying to find a program. It's about trying to go deeper. Wanting to reach out to the community is a direct result of your prayer and your approach of Christ. Because then you actually begin to see the icons that are in front of you. You understand what I mean by that? Everyone is an icon that you see. Those people at the Piggly Wiggly, they're an icon. And you never know, right? All those people, all of you are icons covered with soot and dirt. And the prayers of the church and confession comes in and it slowly, slowly cleans that icon. There's icons out there that need to be brought into the church. And they need to be restored, right? But they're only going to be done gently as an iconographer, I could tell you the little bit of restoration I have done, if you go in there and you try to get it done because you want to get it done, you will ruin it. If you go in there and lovingly, slowly, prayerfully restore that icon and clean it, glory be to God, you will see that saint coming through. This is the approach. It's not numbers. It's not programs. It can't be. And it's a temptation if you start feeling that way. I'm telling you, it's a temptation. Numbers are not where it's at. Quality. Quality of prayer. Quality of relationship. When, when you say it's not numbers, and um, I hear you saying we're not selling anything, right? We, we don't need anybody to buy, right? Um, so what is it that we're motivating. Is there, is it, is it on the last day that we stand there and we said, I went out. I went out, I had, I, I went to the prison, right? I went to the sick. Is it that? Is it that to, to stand there and, and be able to say that we did what we could with, the, with what was given to us? It can be. Um, St. Nikolai Veromovich, he has a very interesting point. I think there's other fathers who said it, but you know there's these three types of people in the church. There's the slave, there's the mercenary, and there's the son. Mm. The slave serves because he fears hell. He fears what his master will do. The mercenary serves because he wants the rewards. The son serves because he loves his father. Sounds like a good first line. I like that. I have a yes, ma'am. So, how do we move it beyond? the approach of service because oh God. within the greater community yeah. there are a number of people who might be spiritually lacking something but we don't necessarily have that easy way in of the typical things that we think about when we think of outreach like the soup kitchens and things like that there are some people who simply don't have the fullness of the faith and those people should they sh they should experience that as well. Are you, are you saying like people that, that don't need soup? 
Yeah, they like, don't need soup, they don't need clothes, like we, so for they instance, don't have orthodoxy. Right. So for instance, we have, um, there's some very small churches um, in town. Um, we've got a certain uh, homeless population um, that there's a lot of outreach to. We've also got, I mean, Brooklyn Baptist is essentially like a mega church, right? Like, I mean, we're over, over a thousand, something like that, right? They've got more resources than us. They've got uh, more people than us, definitely, right? We're probably not going to beat them on butts and seats, right? Um, they've got all those things. So what, I think, with that background of kind of the shame from the past and the awkwardness of where do we go in the wake of that, how do we approach them? How do we, how do we prepare ourselves more than anything? You said the Holy Spirit moves it, but how do we, how, what do we even... I would even start with somebody right, who because, doesn't really need it. Because if we, if we go to a shelter, for instance, it's, it creates um, a situation for us to, to begin the dialogue. But what if there isn't anything to create a situation for us? How do we empower ourselves to be the creators right? of that situation and of that relationship? Okay. Um, again, uh, I, will, I will say this, uh, and I'm, we'll unpack it, but you have not because you asked them. You have not because you ask not. So you can't leapfrog anything. Purification, illumination, unification is a process by which all of us attain our salvation. You take that three step in the same sense of engagement, right? So once you guys are in the place, which you guys are definitely moving there because I'm here, like I said, this is empirical evidence that something's happening, right? So you begin to encounter this primarily begin to encounter a space by which there's a measure of faith that you guys would lovingly receive families. You have to be ready to receive the blessings that they get poured out. Okay, boom. So once that comes, then there will be a natural, which may or may not have already, be, already started, but there will be a natural organic insight to something. And, and I'm not trying to be evasive. What I'm trying to really do is I'm trying to tell you I have seen works not go forward because someone said, hey, I'm the expert, do what I said, this and this and that, and they spend all this effort over here and they neglect this thing that they should have been doing. But that being said, let me just throw out a couple ideas, okay? Which don't listen to them, but just <laughs> giving, giving ideas, right? <clears throat> Is there an OCF chapter here? Ah, don't, don't answer, it's all rhetorical. The point isn't for you to do these things. I'm trying to give you, right? Is there an OCF chapter? Okay. Uh, is there a local study on uh, the ancient uh, desert fathers at the local bookstore? Um, is there a, um, what city are we in? Columbia. Yeah. That's like the rock and roll mistake, number one. Don't ever say like, where am I at? But yeah. <laughs> Good night, Oklahoma. Like, <laughs> but, but but the thing is, like, okay, so is there a local coalition of pastors here that meets and gets together to deal with some of the issues, the broader Christian issues, right? right? So the thing is, is understanding. I don't, I don't necessarily feel comfortable with saying it's out of the context of serving. I think it's just what type of service are you doing? Service is a very broad, multifaceted, diverse reality. Service can look like all kinds of different things. And so being out there, just in general as a community, things will, things will begin to, to take shape. And don't ever underplay simple relationships. Because father having a relationship with one of the pastors over something that's a local issue, that's huge. And I'll tell you another thing, father having that relationship with one of the local pastors, let's say African American pastors, and father's in there, like I know he would be, as a simple, good Orthodox priest, not pushing anything, but just the presence, those questions will be asked. Right. Because remember everybody, right? It's the presence of Christ, not our understanding of Christ. Do you see the difference? You see the difference? It's the presence of Christ, not the understanding. Your understanding may be very minimal, but the presence may be huge. That's that's what like gets people's hearts. Father. 
Well, uh, you may not believe it, but the hour is already up. <gasps>